Reverend Sarah Facemeyer Lamb, pastor of Sand Hill United Methodist Church in Boaz, West Virginia, and pastor of Wayside United Methodist Church in Vienna, West Virginia. Let us pray. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us all. Give us eyes to see, ears to hear, hearts and spirits that are receptive hearts and spirits to receive the word you have for us this day. May your word shape us into the people you desire us to be. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our gospel lesson is from Mark chapter 1, verses 4 to 11. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven. You are my son, the beloved. With you I am well pleased. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. If you've ever read through the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, if you've ever read through them one after the other, then maybe you have found yourself wondering, hey, didn't I just read that? Each of the Gospels is an account of the good news of Jesus, his life, death, and resurrection. And so they contain some of the same stories, many of the same stories. Occasionally, one of the evangelists will be the only one to tell us about some detail of Jesus' life. Matthew is the only one who tells us about the visit of the Magi. Luke is the only one who tells us the details of Jesus' birth with the manger and the angels and the shepherds. John is the only one who tells us that Jesus is the divine, eternal word who was with God and is God and through whom all things came into being. So there are these sometimes very different stories. Sometimes one or two or three of them will have stories in common. But sometimes all four Gospels tell the same story. Each in their own way, but the same story. That's the way it is with Jesus' baptism. John was in the wilderness preaching a message of repentance. He was baptizing those who came to him, washing them with water to sin.
symbolize that their sins were washed away. They were forgiven. John told those who came for baptism, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. When Jesus was baptized by John, it was not for the repentance and forgiveness of sin. Jesus was without sin. Hebrews chapter 4, it tells us we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who in every respect has been tested as we are, yet without sin. In 1 Peter chapter 2, it says he committed no sin and no deceit was in his mouth. And 1 John chapter 3, verse 5 says that Jesus was revealed to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. If Jesus was without sin, then why was he baptized? Why did he submit to baptism? In Philippians, the Apostle Paul writes, let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself, and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. That's what Jesus, his life looked like. It was a life of self-emptying, a life of humility. He emptied himself and he humbled himself and he was baptized by John. When Jesus came up out of the water, the heavens were torn apart. The Spirit of God descended like a dove and rested upon him, and God's own voice proclaimed, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. This was something new and different that God was doing. When Jesus was baptized by John, baptism took on a new meaning. We are no longer baptized with the baptism of John. The baptism of John looked forward to the coming of Jesus. John's was a baptism of preparation for Jesus. John's was a baptism of water. In Christian baptism, we use water, but it is about so much more than the water. When we are baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, we are filled with the Holy Spirit and we are claimed as beloved children of God. It is God who does the work of Christian baptism. It's God who makes the, the baptism effective, that makes it take. That is why it isn't possible to be re-baptized. The effectiveness of baptism doesn't ultimately depend on the people involved, the pastor or priest or whoever does the baptism. The effectiveness of baptism doesn't ultimately depend on the person 
being baptized. It is God who does the work of Christian baptism, and God doesn't get it wrong. God doesn't need to do God's work again, but there are times when we need to do, we need to do our part again. Maybe you don't remember your baptism because you were a child. God didn't get it wrong, but you need to do your part. Saying no to sin and saying yes to God. Making a profession of your own faith. Maybe since your baptism you've strayed from God. God didn't get your baptism wrong. You don't need to be water washed again. But maybe you need to do your part of turning away from sin and turning more fully to God. If you need to mark this change in a public way, then you can reaffirm your faith, renewing your baptismal vows. You know, much like married couples sometimes renew their wedding vows. Married couples who renew their vows, they don't actually get married again, but they renew their commitment to one another. Rebaptism isn't possible because God is the one who does the work of baptism, and God doesn't get it wrong. What then of the disciples, the Jesus followers in Ephesus that Paul questions in Acts chapter 19? He said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you became believers? They replied, no, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Then he said, into what then were you baptized? They answered into John's baptism. Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. Altogether, there were about twelve of them. The disciples at Ephesus, they weren't re-baptized. They received Christian baptism for the first time. They originally had been baptized into John's baptism, which was a baptism of repentance alone. When they received baptism in the name of Jesus, they received the Holy Spirit. If someone grew up in uh, the Catholic Church, um, was baptized um, in the Catholic Church or Presbyterian or a Baptist Church or Episcopalian or Orthodox or Church of Christ or Disciples of Christ or any other Christian denomination. If they wanted to join in Christian fellowship with Sand Hill or Wayside United Methodist Churches, they would be warmly welcomed. Their baptism would be recognized. They've already been baptized, and God did the work of their baptism. So there is no need for them to be baptized again. Just as when someone who was baptized in a United Methodist Church, when they desired to become a member of a Catholic Church, um, the Catholic Church asks for a certificate of 
baptism or sometimes I've even just received those phone calls from, from a Catholic church. Can, can you vouch for this person that they've been baptized and their baptism is recognized and accepted as a valid baptism. They, they don't need to repeat their baptism. God does the work of baptism and God doesn't get it wrong. In baptism, God claims us as God's own beloved children, and we are filled with the Holy Spirit. In our baptism, we share in Jesus' baptism. In Romans 6, Paul writes, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him by baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. But if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider, consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Jesus has defeated sin and death. And when we accept Jesus as Savior and follow him as Lord, when we are baptized in the name of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit, we share in that victory. Thanks be to God who claims us as his own beloved children, who fills us with his Holy Spirit, who gives us the victory over sin and death. Will we live as who we are? As we close, I, I'm going to share with you um, the vows, the reaffirmation of baptis baptismal vows from the United Methodist Book of Worship. Hear these words and meditate upon these words. On behalf of the whole church, I ask you, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, oppression, in whatever forms they present themselves. Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in his grace, and promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races? According to the grace given to you, will you remain faithful members of Christ's holy church and serve as Christ's representatives in the world? Let us pray. Holy God, we pray that you would help us to say yes to you. 
We pray that you will lead us and guide us and help us to indeed be your faithful people in this world, your faithful representatives, Christ's faithful representatives in the world. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. And now hear these words of blessing from Colossians 3, 15. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. 